that uh, everything functions as well as can be, uh, and we're just going to take it from there. Um, our lovely Christine Joanna Hart is with us this afternoon in England. It's high noon in London, and it's 4 a.m. A Pacific Daylight Time in San Francisco, where I'm at. And we're going to let uh, Christine Joanna Hart kind of lead the conversation organically. Uh, we'll take it as it comes and just uh, kind of enjoy the ride. Uh, so, darling, just yeah. Uh, Hello, to? Douglas. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you um, for letting me interview you about this subject. And I wanted to talk today about es extraterrestrials and what's happening with them and events in the world and, you know, what part they might be playing. Um, for, for my own side, I, I've just released my book, The Serial Killer Psychic, um, which is on Amazon. I'll give you a link for that, actually. And, you know, I've had my own experience with with these beings. Um, you know, I grew up in care. I grew up in a Vatican run orphanage and was, you know, adopted. And there was a nun who took a lot of interest, um, my father's auntie. And I I don't know if I encountered these beings when, when I was you know, when I was young, when I was a very little girl. Um, but certainly as I got older and, you know, noticed in serial killers that they, I didn't believe that they were organic, that they were controlled by these beings who literally rode them. And so my book is all about that, my search for them, these invisible creatures. Um, and then, of course, I came across Miles Johnson's basis and the super soldier program and, you know, Max and James Casbolt and Sarah. And, you know, it's quite interesting today. I mean, Sarah does um, interaction with E.T. and takes a lot of us in her group. She runs multidimensional group realm walking. And she did a conference recently where she um channeled them down and so the audience received them and I actually had this experience in her group where she said she will now channel them and one of them appeared to me inside my mind and it was really fascinating he had bright green eyes and told me what star seed I was from and they're very fascinating these these beings um I had on my radio show um, Sheikh Ben Halama, who casts out these, he calls them jinn, because he's a Muslim, and he asked me to meet him in a dream, which I did, and then he showed me a portal, which I went through, and there was, as Brian Barrett calls it, the calf, the world of the jinn. Um, so I'm still fascinated by these beings, like how they appear to some people, um, the reptilian thing and the greys, um, how they appear to me, which is just as humanoid, um, and what influence they have on the world. For instance, in Sheen, which is quite near to where I live, um, it's a suburb of London. It's actually a very well-to-do suburb. There was a mother um, who was driving a four by four. They all drive those big sub four by fours. Yes. And she came, yeah, and she came out of a road and apparently the car just smashed through a wooden fence and aimed at a tea party that children were having and okay. killed one eight year old. Another, Jeez. yeah, another one of them is um, in hospital. There's loads injured, I think 10 injured. There's a baby injured as well. Oh. Um, and I felt it was like dark because obviously these ET some of them are good some of them are bad and I thought it was almost like a school shooting and I thought it was funny the way this um big sov maneuvered itself because if you see on the diagrams it came out of one road and it literally aimed for the kids which was about 300 yards and I thought is that that same activity that serial killers where they get a dark ET come into them or school shooters. So what's your opinion on that, Douglas? Well, Michael Aquino uh, called those riders. Uh, these oh, really? are, 
Yes, the riders, they're, they're uh, entities that uh, basically uh, uh, grab a person and uh, ride them, just like you would a wild bronco, uh, trying to break them, tame them. With serial killers, uh, they get broken, they get tamed. Uh, and um, he considered them to be um, extraterrestrial in a sense. They may as well be. Uh, certainly, um, they are extra dimensional. Uh, as for um, uh, aliens doing this, it would have to, uh, what would be the purpose? What would it serve their uh, particular culture? Uh, it could could it be like a form of predatory hunting? Uh, but in in the end, I think that um, your Muslim friend um, who refers to them as the jinn, uh, or in this case, negative jinn. Um, there's good jinn and there's bad jinn, or rather, there's uh, jinn that are uh, benevolent and jinn that are malevolent. Uh, understand that the um, uh, jinn uh, have no reason to trust humanity either. Uh, when uh, ever uh, rulers of any power have been given some access to uh, the ability to control jinn, they enslave them, they bond them, bind them, uh, force them into a, a kind of servitude, uh, as Solomon did uh, in the building of the temple, um, as uh, various such entities were. Uh, Bound by uh, bound by Alexander the Great, uh, in terms of his driving the ghoul back behind the, uh, uh, the earthen walls, as they were described in uh, later accounts, basically back underground. Uh, it took uh, entities of great power to do that. Uh, so being bound as they were historically in the past, uh, um, they have their vengeance by uh, basically victimizing humans uh, that are vulnerable, in a vulnerable state, an open-minded state, almost do an empty-minded do, state. Do you think that they, because um, school-run mums are notorious, I've been one, notorious for having their head in the clouds. I mean, the school run is quite a monotonous thing to do. So when you're doing it, you tend to be your mind is elsewhere. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's quite a difficult thing in that at a certain time every day you have to be somewhere and you know mix with other people you might not feel like doing that so do you think in this case that she might have had something like a rider experience it certainly sounds like it i i couldn't say absolutely but i'd come pretty close i would uh uh, it, it definitely has that resonance to it. It's um, it does, yeah. um, and and um, the way that I would express it is um, when people are doing these things mechanically, um, then uh, what happens is the mind enters that zone of uh, uh, mindlessness. Uh, now, uh, people actually seek this state who are seeking uh, enlightenment. Um, Zen Buddhist monks, for instance, are people who are pursuing uh, a kind of uh, Zen meditation. You're emptying your mind, you're um, becoming um, uh, basically um, a kind of a, a, a empty vessel, uh, but you're doing this with the intent of uh, basically purging yourself of a lot of baggage of what holds you to uh, what holds you bound to material existence. You're doing this so you can attain a form of enlightenment. Um, this can happen organically or naturally with people in some professions. Um, it's almost you're almost forced to attain this state of mind in some professions. Uh, say, for instance, if you're a sniper and you're uh, posted or assigned to uh, ambush uh, a convoy, uh, which is, its arrival is unknown, really. It's it's known that uh, logistical resupply of a certain area has to be conducted within uh, the week, um, but you have no idea, or the high command that assigned you has no idea when exactly uh, the enemy will even get enough supplies together to run a convoy. Uh, but uh, so you're set up to ambush this convoy and you um, have to maintain position. Uh, somebody who's doing that, who's maintaining themselves as uh, undetectable as possible, uh, burdened by the ghillie suit, the need to maintain um, the camouflage on the camouflage netting, uh, um, maintaining, say, for instance, leaves or various other organic twigs and whatnot that can easily fall off and replacing them, uh, is sitting down and um, not moving for that period of time. Very different than if you're in another form of combat, uh, you're maintaining a stillness. 
that requires a peace of mind. If you don't attain that peace of mind, that kind of sense of uh, of uh, not being there while being there, um, well, you're going to fail. <laughs> and uh, so it, when a person is in that position, then uh, they can um, ultimately attain a kind of Zen-like state um, without entering a monastery. Uh, so this can happen in some professions where a person uh, attains this as part of the situational um, circumstances, the uh, requirements, the demands. Uh, and uh, when it comes to other people, they might attain it in prison, people who are imprisoned or a prisoner of war uh, in certain cases, um, and you're left with no stimulation and uh, or your stimulation is so uh, repugnant or vile or uh, you're just blocking it out. All of this uh, results in a kind of forced attainment of a kind of state of no mind. But with other people, it happens in a more negative sense. I mean, even though what I presented was was negative to obviously to in its own sense. Uh, uh, I mean, after all, the only situation that might even be considered mildly positive would be the person who's doing this at home or the person who's doing it in a monastery. Um, but when it comes to uh, other kinds of jobs where that might be attained, might be park rangers or something. But when it comes to school mothers, uh, as you say, doing the school run, uh, that has got to be one of the worst things in the world. It, it's got you're getting up every morning and you're yeah. doing this mechanically. And yeah. then what happens is the mind simply vacates. But you enter this kind of no state, this state of mindlessness. And in that state, one is very easily and readily possessed. So uh, a rider hops aboard uh, the person, not the car. Uh, the car is jacked by the uh, person who's piloting the meat sock puppet at that point mm -hmm. the, uh, behind the wheel. And um, so I get that resonance uh, as that having happened here. It's beyond tragic. Yeah, I, mean, I it's terrible. Um, but, you know, the the press are, are covering up at the moment you know they're not releasing um a picture of the woman um or saying you know what happened and it's very clear to me that as a journalist um ex-journalist i suppose that they would be able to in a little village like wimbledon find out in five minutes who she actually was i mean she was a member of the golf club so they know but they're not putting it out there. I mean, if it was a Muslim, if it was a Muslim male, they would now, everybody would be saying it was done deliberately because of the way, you know, the it burst through a fence and then it plowed into the Tea Party. I mean, it just seems to me to be, um, to be this happening. And interestingly, the other day after I self-published as you know, I've been published before, but I self-published The Serial Killer's Psychic, which is an occult version of my life. So it's my life written, but with a strong slant on um, an experience of these beings. And as I was just laying there, um, this being um, appeared to me, who looked like Putin, took the form of Putin, and says to me, um, we're going to astrally detain you in one of our rooms. Uh, and I replied to him, what do you mean one of our rooms? And he showed me these rooms and they, it was like a big room and it went on to a bigger room and it was human beings hung upside down on meat hooks. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, and don't think that they're dead. They're not dead. And he pulled one of their heads up and it was someone just hanging there tortured. And he said, um, we don't like you talking about us and trying to reveal us, you know, to the public. And, um, you know, I, I said back, I I'm not afraid of you. And um, he said back, no, I said um, that my book probably wouldn't even be read by anybody. I don't actually believe that self-publishing works. And then he showed me a future time when actually it would be read. And, um, he said, this is the consequence that you will be kept in one of these rooms. And I, I tried to get information out of him. And I said, am I right? And I used the term, actually, he used the term riders. And he said, you're right about these serial killer trash, that they're just, you know, these young boys, they're always about 25. And the school shooters 
and you know they have this slippery hold on their bodies and he used that term riders actually he said yes we ride them he said uh, 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 and i always thought there was some connection between them but he said that they're just stupid that they haven't really got hold of their brain and mm -hmm. that they were easy for them to ride on and i thought about these beings and they do when they interact they do pick out things that your mind that you they take the form of somebody you might be afraid of or if they want to interact with you in a positive way they might take the form of somebody um a movie star that you feel comfortable with to interact with you and i thought about them and i thought about their um interaction with our world and i was wondering how powerful um they were in our world and how much and i know the muslims talk about the gin like london is saturated by gin and there's so much gin activity going on there's certainly a lot of bizarre crimes um child murder etc going on in our world um and i wondered i mean i do have a past life recall which i wrote about in the book of being um used from childhood i had a twin um i was taken with my twin clara I was called Hans and I was tortured and I had needles stuck in my cheek and then um, electric put through the needles. And I don't know if it was Mengler or not, but certainly somebody who then raped me. I was a little boy and then seeing my twin Clara murdered. And then I went up through these. Um, I was then um, enrolled into the um, Nazi army. Um, I was stationed at Treblinka and I have recall of myself being a boxer, um, working at Treblinka and then at Velversburg Castle. And at Velversburg Castle, it was pretty interesting because we were there trying to open portals. And at one point we opened a portal and I managed to see my sister, um, Clara, and I was shown that she wasn't dead. She was just in another realm. And then another SS officer who was present then took out a knife and slit the neck of some of the other men um, as a sacrifice to this being, whatever it was. Um, the portal was open, the being came through. And OK, so that's 1945 or 1944. Uh, but what surely that has increased since then our governments or our world leaders interacting with these beings so how much how much interaction do they have i want to ask you and of course in my life i was born into my next lifetime i was born into the hands of the vatican literally i was i think put into a 13 year old there was a priest involved right at the start and then as soon as she popped me out i was handed over to the vatican to do what they wanted with um so there seems to be a thing with the vatican are uh, um, somehow controlling this or controlling those that have been linked with the Nazi experiments. So what's actually going on there, Douglas? Well, um, definitely when it comes to Vladimir Putin, um, the entity uh, taking his form is, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's no mistake there, uh, and you may have been astrally or uh, in your um, uh, astral projection mode uh, interacting with the real Vladimir Putin. Uh, the attitude uh, sounds uh, precisely uh, accurate. Um, he would view uh, the majority as I would view the majority of uh, young testosterone filled men as uh, empty and violent, just empty vessels of violence who are uh capable of almost nothing but appalling uh acts of violence uh, the majority of uh uh young men have no grip on uh their body their reality their uh all they are are hormones testosterone rage anger uh frustration uh and uh they're easily jacked uh by such entities riders as uh putin referred to them as he would be the man to take advantage of these kinds of resources, these useful idiots, as he would call them. Uh, that's the Russian cultural tr tradition. 
Um, and uh, the reason it's so fitting in line with the keynote was because I'm not quite sure if you're aware of this or if I ever brought it up with yourself, uh, but I've certainly brought it up in the past with um, my own program and my own transmissions was that for the longest time, I never spoke of it simply because of all of the forewarnings I had with people uh, who, who I was involved with originally professionally was that, oh, this is something you'll never speak about in your life. You can't because it would simply render you vulnerable to uh, being framed uh, as a patsy uh, like Lee Harvey Oswald was. Uh, people were telling me you can never um, let it be known that you were deployed to Russia uh, under orders from Michael Aquino. So because I speak a degree of Russian, uh, fairly fluent, certainly more so at the time, uh, the, uh, when I was dispatched to uh, Russia, I was ordered to rendezvous with the resistance. Now, at the time, uh, this was in the uh, very um, the mid uh, to late 1980s. So understand that the Greater Soviet Union was still in operation. And um, at that time, everyone in the American think tanks was committed to believing that it was getting stronger by the day and that the future belonged to the Soviets, that there was no hope for the West and that the, uh, uh, the Soviets would inherit the mantle of humanity. That they, uh, I mean, is a good example of this. One of their um, shills, uh, who was the, um, uh, I forget what his name is, uh, but he's that uh, old commie who runs for president in the United States all the time as a Democrat, Bernie Sanders. Uh, he, just before the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union in 1989, 1990, uh, that, that area of time, uh, he, he was just months before the uh, Soviet Union would collapse and the hammer and sickle would be lowered on Christmas Eve uh, from the Kremlin spires. Uh, that idiot came home to the United States and said, I have seen the future and it is the greater Soviet Union and Soviet communism. Uh, this was... Uh, everybody was on the stage of indoctrination right up to the last minute. Uh, so with that in mind, everyone viewed um, uh, with with understandable reason the greater Soviet Union as the ultimate security state. And um, so when I was dispatched behind the lines to rendezvous with the resistance, the first thing anyone would ask is, what resistance? Uh, the uh, KGB was uh, pervasive. It was um, uh, it was just omniscient in everybody's eyes. Um, it was the way a Russian person would describe it would be that um, it would be like uh, a lifetime of bad weather, uh, a lifetime of inclement weather, where there is always this presence, the shadow, the cloud of the police state. And that's the way it was for the average uh, human being in the Soviet Union. When it came to the um, uh, weakness of the state that Michael Aquino saw right through, uh, it was their godlessness. In their atheism, they had to uh, put all their energies into suppression of the church, the suppression of faith. Uh, because of this, they had to deny the existence of Satanists. It, to acknowledge that there were Satanists would be to acknowledge that the church had validity in its doctrine. Uh, since they were state-sponsored atheism as their doctrine of faith, uh, since they held that as such, the Soviets had to uh, suppress the church and therefore deny anything the church believed in. So the only people who had a free hand, a license to kill on uh, both sides of the Iron Curtain were the Satanists, which of course Michael Aquino was the preeminent Satanist. So when you come to the situation in the United States, to give you an example, uh, because it's valid, it's important, it's relevant, uh, and then uh, it takes us back to Putin and your dream, what this indicates. When it uh, comes to the United States and with the situation that we had here, uh, say, for instance, 
Inspector Sandy Gallant of the San Francisco Police Department was this tall, blonde haired, blue eyed Nordic Aryan woman who uh, specialized in occult crime. She uh, made her career uh, with the discovery of a headless body in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And uh, in place of the human head was the head of a chicken. She said this is uh, a voodoo murder and the people intend to recover the body later, sew the head back on and create a zombie. Uh, so everyone laughed at her, uh, but they put the body underground in the San Francisco coroner's office. They didn't even bother with a policeman on watch. They hired a private security guard. Uh, that private security guard paid for that with his life. He fought to the death to make certain that body wasn't taken. His body was found the next morning, but the body was still there, not recovered. He had prevented it from being stolen uh, in this tremendous struggle that had taken place during the night. And uh, at that point, she became world famous. Then uh, it became known that the attempt to create a zombie had been uh, foiled because of her advisement. And uh, from that point forward, she became a consultant. She could have retired quit her job from the SFPD, San Francisco Police Department, become a private consultant worldwide at that time, is certainly how it looked. It, without her, I never would have taken down the San Francisco uh, Presidio military base. Uh, through her, I got my high school teacher busted for the molestation of all of these children at the uh, daycare center, along with many, many others who were not uh, indicted or busted, but he was at least. This was because we had evidence of the child pornography he kept on site the high school that I attended. He was my high school uh, illustration teacher, a teacher in commercial illustration, commercial advertising. And that was Gary Willard Hambright, a uh, sworn Baptist minister without a pulpit, uh, slept in a church, but he couldn't keep his child pornography there. So he kept it on site, the San Francisco Unified School District property. That's what they busted him for. That's how the San Francisco police were able to bust him because the Presidio police, the army police, the CID criminal investigations division, Presidio Provost Marshall was completely corrupt, portrayed in the movie Presidio by Sean Connery as this uh, likable fellow. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, these people were all involved with the Satanism that was uh, going on on site the Presidio, the child, human child trafficking that the human, uh, that the US Army was involved with. Uh, so when it came to uh, our taking down Gary Willard Hambright, the Presidio, all that's a different story. We don't need to go into that right now. The important point being that Sandy Gallant then helped to write a uh, field manual on occult crime. And uh, this was going into the ring binders of police stations everywhere. And police have these huge ring binders. Like if you see a DEA drug enforcement officer's manual, this will be like a uh, ring binder so that they can rip in, uh, rip out new laws whenever, uh, uh, put in new laws whenever new laws are uh, enacted. They can rip out old ordinance whenever it becomes obsolete. Uh, in the case of the occult field manual, uh, the field manual on occult crime, uh, it was only in those ring binders for a period of months. Uh, Michael Aquino responded by sending uh, his he is Bulldog, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, oh God, he was in charge of the 1st Earth Battalion. Uh, Chapman, I think his name was, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I bleached so many of these people from my mind because they're so unpleasant. Uh, but uh, he went around to lecture the uh, uh, various federal agencies, FBI, as well as all of uh, the major constabularies like uh, Los Angeles Police Department, uh, and um, when he was uh, lecturing them, uh, he would tell them that you can't persecute the satanic church based on crimes that are committed by Satanists because that would be persecuting a church and against the freedom of religion in the United States. Uh, I'm trying to remember that idiot's name, uh, but it's in the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats. He was portrayed by George Clooney where they turned this guy into a sex object, a sex bomb, when nothing again could be further from the truth. This individual was uh, just one of the most repulsive people imaginable in charge of the 1st Earth Battalion, James Channing. James Channing was the man's name. 
And James Channon would say that if somebody tried to rob a bank and they dropped a saint's medallion of uh, the Virgin Mother Mary uh, on site, the scene of the crime, does that implicate the Catholic Church? And of course, everyone said no. And uh, then he said, then when you find a headless body in a, the middle of a pentagram that's drawn in human blood or goat's blood, uh, that doesn't implicate the satanic church either. It just means that a murder has been committed and you have to pursue it without uh, implicating the satanic church. And all of the uh, sheriffs and uh, bureau agents and police departments all said, great, that means less work for us. So then the occult crime manual was ripped out of all of those police ring binders. And at that point, the FBI, uh, all of the federal agencies, the police uh, constabularies all over the United States became enablers, effectively implicated in satanic crime. They, uh, whenever they find a headless body in the middle of a pentagram drawn in human blood, they will erase all the evidence. They will hose away the human blood. They will destroy all evidence at the crime scene, connecting it to the satanic church, and basically pursue it as a murder in which they catch a single individual or a group of teens at the most, maybe. Uh, they'll implicate somebody directly responsible in the crime uh, if they pursue it at all. Otherwise, however, any networking will be simply uh, dismissed. Uh, oh. This is so. What, so, yeah. so, what was the um, the the people that he had hanging up? Um, so, so, I mean, is that where they take people? That is that well, a real place, or well, where people were hanging on meat hooks? Is that well, in the astral? So, that's that's symbolic. That's in the astral. That would be on one of the lower planes of existence where people sink to if they're of a lower vibration and they're stuck in a certain mind frame. Uh, you don't need to worry about that being your ultimate fate. Um, he's threatening you because of your being a threat to him. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the point that I'm making about the Russian connection here, uh, at the time that this went down and the police stopped pursuing the Satanists in America and their crimes, at that point, moment james channon uh and who's again portrayed by george clooney in the men who stare at goats and if you ever met the real james channon he had uh tremendous bags under his eyes that were um the the color of beef liver uh his breath was was rancid because of all the drinking that he did his liver was disintegrating inside of him you could smell his decaying liver on his breath uh but this guy was um someone who uh was not george clooney but they made him as such in the film and portrayed them, the, all of these people as likable f people. Nothing could be further from the truth, but this goes to show how Satanism is propagandized in the United States. Whereas what happened was Ter Maui Terry, who wrote the book, The Ultimate Evil, a journalist like yourself, he uh, became a former journalist because when he exposed the connection between the Son of Sand mur murders and the Charles Manson murders, uh, the um, uh, son of Sam was going to admit to being connected to the West Coast, Charles Manson cult. And that's when uh, people of, well, people of power came in, visited him and told him to shut up. And after that, he shut up and said he was responsible alone and uh, took that secret with him to the grave. Uh, Maori Terry, on the other hand, uh, was proving that all of this was connected, that there was a network that was enabled by the police because they were erasing the evidence. And because at that point in America, the Satanists had 007 license to kill. Now understand that that was exactly the same case in the Soviet Union. So in the Soviet Union, because they couldn't declare that Satanists existed, any crime committed by a Satanist was covered up by the state because they couldn't admit that they existed and therefore the Satanists could kill whoever they wanted. This is why I was dispatched behind the Iron Curtain to rendezvous with Alexander Dugin, who was always proudly introduced by uh, Alex Jones as Putin's brain. He was Putin's Rasputin. He was, in essence, the man who brought Putin to power. Uh, he and his organization were uh, very active uh, during the time of the Soviet Union. They were the only uh, network the Soviets dared not touch 
or interfere with, the KGB gave them carte blanche. And as a result, they could plot the downfall of the Soviet Union and the installation of their puppet president, Vladimir Putin. When it came to this satanic takeover of the Soviet Union, this was orchestrated by Michael Aquino on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And this was Satanists that ruled America, uh, making certain that Satanists would conquer Russia. And uh, when it came to the situation in which I enabled this, uh, I was there for a period of about two weeks during which I uh, rendezvoused with these people, spoke with them. And of course, uh, ultimately they did what they did and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Vladimir Putin was ultimately installed after a period of chaos, which was intentional so that people would demand order, demand uh, a, a state control, no matter how. Uh, repressive and uh, ultimately we're in the situation that we're in today. You're personally threatened, of course, because you're exposing this in connection with myself. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why you also have memories that go back to the Third Reich, which of course resisted the original uh, conquests of the Soviet Union. Um, your memories, of course, are such that uh, you are um, remembering uh, accurately some elements of uh, what happened and uh, others are somewhat stylized. Some of the memories are somewhat stylized, impacted by your abuse over the years uh, by the um, MK Ultra program that uh, or Britain's version thereof uh, that uh, was uh, abusing you. The thing to remember about the Vatican is that the Vatican was heavily connected with Nazism because of the desire to prevent a communist takeover of Europe. Uh, the Vatican was in Italy, which had a uh, a very um, heavy communist influence uh, before and after the war. There was every chance at that time that the communists would have conquered Italy and the Pope would have had to have gone into exile. Uh, to try and preempt that or prevent that, uh, the Vatican did everything it could to help the Nazis escape where it could, the so-called rat lines. These were uh, uh, an underground railroad for the Nazi exodus. One of the elements of that supermassive exodus was um, help by the Vatican city-state. The uh, thing to remember is that Adolf Hitler was uh, born in Austria, which was a uh, Roman Catholic nation. In fact, uh, that's one of the unusual aspects of Adolf Hitler was that the overwhelming majority of Germany outside of Bavaria and certain other areas south of the Limes Wall. Uh, the Limes Wall is uh, far more pronounced in cultural impact or equally pronounced in cultural impact in Germany as the Hadrian's Wall in England. Of course, Hadrian's Wall divides the Scots, the former Picts, the, the, the Pictish tribes from the Angles or the what became the Anglo-Saxon people. Uh, in Germany, uh, the North-South division, uh, the division between Protestantism and Catholicism is the Limes Wall. And the Limes Wall, um, south of that wall are the Roman Catholic uh, um, states uh, like Bavaria in particular. And then north of that would be Prussia and the rest of Germany, which is very Protestant. But the majority of Germany is essentially Protestant in cultural um, uh, perspective and paradigm. And that's what made it so strange that Hitler became a president. He was like John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a Roman Catholic president of the United States. Hitler became consular of Germany as a Roman Catholic. It was quite the exception to their history. And uh, because he was from Austria and a uh, born a Roman Catholic and baptized as such, he never renounced his religion. So that was also one of the reasons that the Vatican helped the Nazis was uh, Hitler's Catholic background. So when they um, helped many of them escape, then uh, this was a, in the name of fighting communism. It didn't matter to them that many Nazis were neo-pagan. Uh, what was what the greater threat was atheistic communism. And uh, so uh, Wevelsburg Castle is, of course, where many neo-pagan rituals were uh, conducted, Gnostic rituals. 
Uh, the um, important thing to remember is that this was heavily influenced by Heinrich Himmler, very different from Adolf Hitler. Uh, Adolf Hitler himself was not someone who would violently disapprove of what was going on, but he was someone who's not necessarily responsible for originating uh, the or initiating the ceremonies that were ongoing there. And um, as for Putin, of course, he is uh, profoundly, quote unquote, anti-Nazi. Uh, but what he supports is the alternative right of uh, today in Europe and America, uh, because uh, the alternative right in Europe and America is, quote unquote, anti-Nazi as well. Uh, understand that Nazism is radical centrism. It's neither to the right nor to the left. And the same with its economy, uh, which is national socialist. So we're not talking about communist or capitalist. Uh, it is a third dimension in economics and ideology. So when it comes to the right wingers, they are radicalized in the Russophiliac sense, meaning they've aligned with Russia. Um, these are Vladimir Putin's useful idiots. And uh, these are the people who are the greatest threat to Europe today. England can stand very tall and proud in that it is uh, uh, standing at the vanguard against Russian aggression. So uh, there's very little of this radicalized uh, right wing influence in uh, England compared to other places. It had its influence in that it led to Brexit, but uh, at this point, Oh, now um, eh, that Brexit is committed to, uh, the right wing that was aligned with Russia in Britain has essentially really lost its power, really spent itself. Uh, so in that sense, uh, England's future is uh, brighter uh, for the moment in that regard, uh, even though it's so challenged in so many other ways. Um, but when it comes to your own experience, your dreams, um, uh, have no fear about Putin or the room that he showed you. Uh, I can assure you that wasn't an ordinary dream. That was very much like a personal visit that you had. Uh, it was one that happened in the astral. And uh, your affiliation with the, myself, the son of Adolf Hitler, obviously makes yourself a threat. Your understanding of the situation from an intuitive sense uh, makes you a threat. Certainly, you're writing the book that you did. As you said, uh, you were shown a time in which it would be widely read. Uh, and even if you're not appreciated, we hope you get appreciated in your lifetime. But even if you're not, um, ultimately, your books will be. And uh, at that time, uh, your great influence is echoing through the ages. This is something that uh, your these entities, like the one that rides Putin, uh, this is what they're responding to now. And uh, so aside from your memories in affiliation with the Reich, of course, this is how, again, we've spoken in the past, how this resulted in your being born into the arms of the Vatican and then ultimately exploited as an intelligence asset. Uh, while being uh, fronted as a journalist. So you certainly served as a journalist and uh, professionally did what you could in that profession as was expected of you, but uh, also it was a cover for your being utilized as an intelligence asset, rather an espionage asset, uh, and you're well aware of that. So with all that being said, one of the things that they did was they tried to affiliate you or have you become used to serial killers, uh, in, understand them, uh, in a sense, work with them. And uh, this is one of the reasons your career developed the way it did. And uh, you wrote books along the lines that you did about um, that particular subject. And um, so... Oh, do, do, do you mean... Um... So I could hang out with the real IRA and the UDA and not be scared because I had been hanging out with murderers before. That's quite true. Yes. Oh, I yes. see. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, because I'd yeah. So I'd be sitting with a real IRA commander and think, well, this is peanuts. I've sat with Ian Brady. Um, yeah. yeah, I understand that. It makes sense, actually. Yes. And, because uh, a lot of them, including John White, who I interviewed um, and had a lot to do with, he was a UDA guy. He had cut up 
um, a couple just just cut them up in little bits uh, for being Catholic. So I had to sit with him, me and he, you know, on his own and not not feel afraid. Yes. Which yes. I wasn't. So, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And it did make the journalists and editors in Belfast quite upset with me. They were like, well, how did you get so close to the UDA? How did you get so close to the real IRA? But that was a willingness to go and be with them, you know, socially and not be afraid, whereas the other journalists wouldn't wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you were uh, trained so that you wouldn't be afraid. And uh, so uh, the difference between terrorists and serial killers is that terrorists are following or committed to an ideology. So they're ideologically motivated. There's a difference, but it's the uh, violence that they're capable of that, uh, again, um, if someone feels fear, they respond to that fear. And uh, because you displayed no fear, because you felt no fear, because you'd been conditioned to, in a sense, uh, uh, feel comfortable with, uh, even seek the company of serial killers, then the uh, people capable of such heinous violence, such as terrorists, uh, not sensing that fear in you, then did not respond to it by acting out. In other words, they, uh, um, if not respected you, at least did not feel uh, a response mechanism. You, they didn't smell the fear or or sense fear from you and therefore uh there was nothing to respond to or react to in mm. terms of the violence that they would otherwise uh inflict on others mm. yeah and I, I think they're used to people being scared of them and i don't think they respond very i think they're offended by it and so me not ex showing it i think they opened up to me and you know gave me a lot of stories um but i was wondering as well i mean how much do these beings have to bear on on our rulers you just said that one of them rode was riding putin and i've actually um had that sort of download too that there is one of them i mean because they are interdimensional and can appear to us and you know i mean are they ruling us right now are we little hamsters in cages and they are calling the shots of planet Earth? It sometimes it can feel like that when one is in a uh, negative enough space where one feels that uh, when one's seen enough negativity and experienced enough negativity that one kind of surrenders to uh, a sort of uh, uh, a surrender mode, uh, a surrender to uh, uh, the darkness then uh, it can seem like that, but that's not the case. It's simply that uh, there's times of anarchy when they run rampant and uh, occupy many, many more people than they would otherwise because many more people become empty and mechanical. Uh, you might think that in a time when uh, the economy is good and uh, or relatively good, I'm not saying it's good right now, but I'm just saying when the economy is good and many people are involved with mechanical employment at such a time, then we're all kind of like in a space of mindlessness where we're simply uh, attempting to get by day by day with the employment. But when it becomes hand to mouth survival and everybody is just truly living day by day in the moment, um, the mind becomes even more blank. You're blocking out everything. Uh, you're blocking out all kinds of negative uh, input, uh, like in a war zone. And uh, this is one reason prostitutes and soldiers smoke and use drugs. Smoking, of course, hits the same nerve receptors as an opiate, uh, as opioids do. So the nicotine really hits those same uh, nerve receptors and uh, you blot things out. This is why writers will smoke a lot back in the old days traditionally and journalists uh, you'd have uh, police doing smoking all the time i mean these are people who are exposed to horror on a daily basis anybody who's uh, writing uh, conducting journalism uh, investigative journalism in particular uh, police uh, investigators in particular 
uh, all of this from soldiers to prostitutes, you need to block out the world around you. So you would desensitize by smoking traditionally. Um, and then uh, there's other drugs involved as well that people got in, get involved with and uh, it becomes rampant. Uh, so when that becomes universal, when it's no longer just those professions that are exposed to uh, a daily uh, a diet of horror, then uh, you, then everybody is just kind of operating mechanically and empty um, in their heads. They're just uh, Does that subsisting. mean that, that a lot of us then are, are, are ridden? For instance, say France, where, you know, a lot of the uh, the North Africans, you know, had the big riot, but then there was a boy killed. So, but do you, do you think that, you know, that kind of thing is, so they access all of the people writing and then causes a kind of a chaos is is that is that them doing that it's uh it, it, there there's an element of that there really is um what happens is that uh during moments like that uh you'll notice some of the people who were brought in for sentencing now france is responding very sternly uh to um the thousands of youth they arrested uh i don't think there's enough room in their prisons uh, but um, some of them were sentenced to three years in prison. Uh, and uh, I don't know if this is going to work out that way where all these people are going to be carrying out their full sentences because of the sheer logistics of uh, supporting that larger prison population. Uh, but uh, there's certainly going to be a big influx into their prisons. And um, you know, many of the people who were brought uh, to trial, uh, they're saying, I, I don't know what happened to me? I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm just, you know, uh, I don't belong here. Uh, now, in some cases, mercy was shown and, you know, the parents had come by and pick these young kids up. We're talking about kids not even of legal age yet. Uh, so uh, you have people caught in the madness of a moment uh, that might be explicable, but really there is an element of the riders moving in. So in these uh, war zones are areas of uh, where are just just ripe for some kind of uh, uh, subsistence existence, then uh, the riders can easily um, insert themselves. So uh, there's an element of this phenomenon uh, that is always ready to break out, uh, take advantage of uh, a mass empty headedness, um, especially when you have a crowd uh a mob uh a, a mob has the uh group think of a unicellular animal uh the um mobs will uh rip people apart they will um uh conduct heinous acts of violence so uh the um the the madness of crowds uh, to a degree has some explanation there is that phenomenon uh, in the occult sense behind it, what your Muslim friend would call the jinn. Uh, okay. Again, uh, always remember that, that there are benevolent jinn as well as malevolent jinn, but uh, um, there is a history of abuse of the jinn by humanity. So uh, the jinn do take advantage of humanity's uh, weak points to uh, strike back. So we could call the writers and the jinn uh, something um, almost interchangeable. Uh, these are like malevolent jinn that are uh, taking advantage of empty people in hard times. Or what, what, what did what did humanity do to the jinn then? What, what did they do to to upset them? Um, enslave them, such as when Solomon was given uh, the power to do so. Um, he enslaved thousands of them to build the temple and other projects. Uh, the um, Alexander the Great um, bonded uh, a number of such entities um, and physical monsters to f drive back the ghoul uh, into the inner earth the, um, uh, to seal them behind uh, uh, what became known as uh, the walls of Gog and Magog in the ancient accounts. So uh, these uh, jinn have a real sense of uh, resentment at being uh, bound and enslaved by powerful human kings in the past. 
So uh, they look on humanity as um, uh, predatory um, and uh, they um, strike back when they can, if given the opportunity, not all of them, but um, a number of them. You could say that there's a number of them that are just as vagrant and delinquent as uh, there are um, such personalities among humanity. Um, so, uh, and, and and was Himmler was Himmler doing something in Velvetsburg Castle with the gin? I mean, the portal that I recall him opening was that to a gin or was it to something else? What the Germans were uh, bringing forth were the old gods, the Norse gods, and understand what you may have seen would be um, a sacrifice based on a voluntary self-sacrifice, volunteers who open themselves for that sacrifice because of the ancient Nordic tradition of calling upon the gods that was very similar to the kamikaze concept. Uh, understand that the Viking, uh, the Vikinger, the um, original uh, Norse uh, culture also had um, their military cults. These were the berserkers, and the berserkers were uh, uh, basically committed to a lifetime of war. They uh, engaged in wearing bear or wolf skins so they could shape shift into those animals. And uh, they would uh, then ultimately uh, become inflicted with the kind of uh, madness that enabled them to uh, withstand severe pain or injury uh, that would be more a mortal blow to other men. And uh, this enabled them to carry the day in battle repeatedly. So the warrior cult of the berserkers and the entire Norse culture was of the understanding that the Norse gods required a sacrifice of the self in battle that your life in battle was not your own. You dedicated it to the gods. And then uh, if you carried yourself and bore yourself well in battle, the uh, Valkyrie in turn would bear you away uh, to Valhalla. And uh, with this kind of concept of self-sacrifice, very similar to the Kamikaze, where the sacrifice of the self helps to invoke the ancestors and the gods to respond to the needs of the empire and ultimately drive the enemy away. A great example of this so that people understand it was that uh, when the uh, Americans invaded Okinawa, they uh, had to take Okinawa in their logic as the gateway to Japan. And uh, it required a fleet the size of the same same size as the fleet that uh, took Normandy at D-Day. We're talking about 4,000 ships at the core of the fleet uh, to take that little tiny island of Okinawa, the capital island of the Ryukyu's island chain. 80% uh, of the uh, American attackers never reached the beaches alive. Uh, they, uh, they were killed before they even got to shore. Um, the Japanese self-sacrifice, not just there, but throughout the Pacific, resulted in uh, calling forth the divine wind, the kamikaze storm. That was the one that had taken down the Mongols, sank at that time the largest invasion fleet in history. Again, the size of a D-Day fleet, same size as the number of ships at D-Day, 4,400 ships. Uh, it resulted in the largest loss of life at sea when the Mongols tried to invade Japan and the kamikaze storm sank the entire Mongol fleet. This was uh, something the emperor had prayed for and his prayers were answered. Uh, the Japanese in World War II recalled that kamikaze storm into being by sacrifice of the self. So when the Americans had invaded Okinawa and established their base to invade Japan, uh, Typhoon Louise emerged, as the Americans called it. And Typhoon Louise, my father was a survivor of that. Uh, he was on the USS Pittsburgh and its bow broke off. They had to actually sail the seas with the front of their ship missing to make it to Hawaii to install a wooden bow so they could make it to the West Coast for repairs. 
Uh, so when it comes to the uh, Typhoon Louise, it emerged out of nowhere and very mechanically, like someone was controlling it with a joystick, made several right angle turns, which of course hurricanes do not naturally do until it hit Okinawa and destroyed the entire American invasion fleet. Uh, it wiped out uh, everything to the point where the Americans had to organize the largest mass evacuation of uh, in American military history, Operation Magic Carpet, to bring back hundreds and hundreds of injured men uh, for treatment in the United States. At that point, the invasion of Japan was impossible and why it never happened. Typhoon Louise is, of course, completely hidden from American history books, but it's an example of self-sacrifice to bring forth a greater being, a greater energy, uh, the gods themselves. The Germans were working with quantity instead of quality for the most part, uh, sacrificing many of the people through the Totenslagen, the death camps, in an attempt to bring back the old gods, the original German gods, the gods of the Black Forest, the aurochs, uh, such as Vodon, Voten, very similar to Odin. Oh, Odin. Oh, is, yes. it, is it Odin? Or I mean, w when I similar. do journeying, I, I often, when I do journeying in other realms, I often come across Fenrir, you know, in, in a cave. And yes. it made me think, because Fenrir is linked with the Norse pantheon, that uh, the jinn are perhaps linked with the Norse pantheon, that the it, Odin it, is maybe a jinn king at the end of the day. Well, I would not perceive it as such, but ultimately what we can perceive is that all of these entities are linked in the sense that we're, we are all part of a cosmology and that, I mean, humanity as well as other subhuman species, as well as the non-human species, uh, we're all part of a greater made a cosmic universe that there is a connection in the sense that beings encounter each other that are normally considered culturally separate concepts but in terms of the old gods of the germans that were uh, there before the norse there before the uh the vikings the ancient germanic god of the black forest was both a war god and a fertility god you're talking about a being that was very similar to the Greek Pan, the great god Pan, of course, uh, who, when he was escaping from the monster uh, Typhus, from whence we derive the word typhoon, uh, he uh, grew a fish's tail, from whence we get the concept of the zodiacal sign Capricorn, uh, I, I think. Uh, the one with the fish's tail and the uh, kind of animal type of um, head. <laughs> Pisces, yeah. Well, not Pisces. <laughs> That's a fish. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when it comes to... Uh, so Pan, so what, what happened yeah. with him? He, he grew a tail and then where did he go? Where's he now? Well, he escaped into the river at that time, uh, Pan. But, but he's normally a god of the forest. It, he's also where we get the term panic from because people panic in the forest. They panic so, in the so, forest. So where is he... Where is he now? All these gods have kind of, uh, shall we say, conceptually uh, faded in the Western mind, but they are basically still extant. You'd say asleep uh, or uh, kind of waiting. Uh, this is what the Germans were trying to reanimate, bring back the old gods to. Uh, you see, the rise of the church, the uh, Western church, the Church of Rome, was uh, also coeval or parallel to the decline of magic in Europe. In order to bring back magic, uh, you would have to reduce the influence of the church. The church monopolizes magic by uh, monopolizing miracles. The church, of course, uh, harnesses magic through prayer. Uh, prayer is simply a form of magic. When you have the doctrinaire church dominating magic, this is why they persecuted the witches, because the witches yeah. were the people's magic. This, uh, the people went to the local witch for various spells, uh, healing, empowerment. Uh, when the church began to fulfill that role, then they had to, in their minds, eliminate the witches to, uh, 
to establish their power permanently. And uh, therefore, millions of women were massacred uh, in a gynocide. When it came to the uh, Nazis and their attempt to bring back the old gods of the original Germanic gods, such as Vodan, understand that Vodan was like Pan in the sense that you uh, Pan, of course, causes panic. People become afraid in the woods. Uh, the original Vodan of the Black Forest was uh, very much a goat's legs, cloven hooves, uh, massive phallus or penis, the super massive stag horns representing fertility and virility and masculinity. Uh, this is when the church decried that entity, that being, and said, that is Satan. Now, there's no biblical description of Satan in that that looks like that. That's not biblical. That's church doctrine. In other words, the church took the ancient God of the Germans and rendered him the very image of Satan itself so as to drive people away from worship of the original God and uh, bring everybody under the bondage of the church. With this mind binding mechanism, this is what it's called mind binding. This uh, axiom wash, the church established its power over the Germanic peoples. The SS was determined to bring back the original God, but simply sacrificing quantity instead of quality, like millions of Jews and Romani gypsies and uh, Slavs and such people wasn't enough the gods demanded quality as well as quantity, and therefore some SS men volunteered themselves to be sacrificed, like the warriors of old, uh, who uh, sacrificed their lives to the gods, and the gods responded to that sacrifice. That's what was going on at Devilsburg that you saw, and the portals being opened. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, um, so today in today's world i mean some people in act with them are, i've got a gin and i certainly do journey into the underworld to find information journey to the upper world and sometimes i will interview people like brian barrett a uh, magician i've had Ian coetting on the show and js garrett but brian barrett will say to me oh you can't interact with a gin because then when you die, you'll be sucked into their world. I mean, what's your opinion on interacting with them? And Because they're quite handy. Like if you, um, all entities like Brian Barrett, for instance, give me a sigil of Shemyaza and I began to meditate on it. And then eventually he came through and they speak in a really fascinating way. Like Shemyaza said to me, um, your jinn must worship me for 50,000 moons and then I will, you know, yada yada. And is it OK to interact with these entities or do you think it's the wrong thing to do? Well, I would say that uh, uh, a, a, there's positive, there's and negative to everything. <laughs> there's advantages and disadvantages to everything. Um, uh, one just wants to be careful um, not to enter any binding contracts, so to speak. Uh, but uh, I think what you're doing is, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, as far as I can ascertain from what you're describing, uh, quite fine. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, uh, you can probably continue to do what you're doing without any uh, particular concern in, in that regard. Uh, when it comes to um, the uh, jinn, uh, it doesn't sound like you're interacting with any uh, particularly malevolent or hostile jinn. Uh, and uh, obviously um, someone who's a doctrinaire Muslim or Catholic or member of any um, particular religion, especially the monotheistic religions of the Abrahamites, would be antithetical against interacting with such entities at all. Uh, but uh, the uh, Third Reich, of course, was a moment of uh, truth in the world when uh, we were experiencing a radical awakening and change. And uh, at that point, the church was no longer the only power uh, in Europe. 
uh, nowadays, of course, the Nazis having succeeded, uh, people are uh, secular in Europe. Europe is essentially godless, as, as godless as the Soviet Union once was. It's but completely godless, completely. I mean, yeah. it's really bad. Yeah, but uh, the, this is an interregnum. It's an interregnum period. Uh, this means that uh, the paganism will uh, return to fill the gap in some areas. Uh, the church will reassert control in others. Uh, it, nature abhors a vacuum, as does power. And uh, religion is essentially a, a power, a form of power. The, it's a power over men's minds and their souls. It's, uh, it's what people fight and kill for. Um, I remember that I was dealing with a um, one of the few engineers trained in the United States. The United States produces less and less engineers. Um, and uh, this individual lived in Ohio. His name was Richard McGuire. Uh, poor guy. And this guy had like a double major in um, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, mechanical assembly line systems. And uh, he uh, he was like uh, just disgusted with uh, speaking with me because uh, he felt that every time he spoke with me, it became a discussion of theology and uh and i explained to him uh you know since we were speaking about social issues most of the time politics social issues uh that's what's relevant uh people will kill or die over their belief in an ideology or uh especially religion faith gods but nobody's going to kill anybody over an artificial intelligence run Mechanical assembly system, <laughs> which was what he specialized in. It's uh, crazy. It's crazy. People are ignorant, really. Um, I just want to go back to the ET question. And Stephen Greer, who you you knew that I met in 2016, he came to London and <clears throat> I went to see him. I went to see him um, as a journalist from the Daily Mail because I spoke to the Daily Mail news desk and you know, they said, oh, yeah, we'll cover that if you like. So I went along there and um, got in for free and I had an interview with him. But there was really strange experiences around that. Like, for instance, uh, the night before I was supposed to see him, I saw orbs for the very first time. Like I was laying there looking out the window in bed two o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep. And I noticed there was a strange pattern over the moon that seemed almost like lace and I thought well, that's really weird so I went to the window and they started to move and they started to move really quickly like just shoot off and so I went outside in the back garden and then they came over the house and there was quite a few of them they were moving up and down in the sky and when they disappeared they did so fast it, they were absolutely fascinating. I filmed them and a local, I spoke to a local paper about them and they said other people had seen them. Mm -hmm. They then wrote a story mocking me and they used my film of them. And um, they said, um, oh, it was a Billy Ocean concert. Now the Billy Ocean concert had ended at 11 p.m. And then they said, oh, it was lights from the rugby grounds. Now, I made those inquiries. I can make inquiries too. They weren't testing any lights that night and lights from rugby cannot do what those orbs did. So it was quite fascinating. They, they were the real deal, these orbs. And I noticed that Stephen Greer was saying in an interview recently that he can send them out these orbs he can send them out anywhere so I thought that was quite interesting he probably wondered why I was wanting to interview him for the mail which is quite a powerful paper here and yeah. I wondered about him because he he is an app and I was in he took us all to this like little basement and then he played these noises <clears throat> And as he was playing them, I felt something go around my heart chakra and try and bind it. So I left and then I almost felt I was tagged. And then afterwards, for a long time, I felt that these entities were on me that sort of followed me home from 
the meeting or whatever. It was a lecture by him on ET. And he now has given out these apps to people and they can, I think they might be free. You get a Stephen Greer app and um, there's even a Facebook group about it. And apparently you can talk to ET through the apps. And people are saying, oh, it's fake, it's fake. But it's not fake, it's real. But I'm wondering which brand of the gin he's dealing with. Or do you think it's not, it's not gin because there's an extraterrestrials and obviously out in America there's lots of people such as Sarah for instance who are interacting with these extraterrestrials who are very fascinating um and then I wondered are they similar to the gin or are they because the one that came to me through Sarah's um group channeling she channeled he was really fascinating he had long white hair and really bright green eyes uh, but then the gin kind of can appear um, similar to that. I mean, they can come in your mind's eye or they can appear outside, depending. So what are your, what's your opinion about extra, extraterrestrials and gin? Are they one and the same? And um, what do you think of Stephen Greer? Well, when it comes to um, Stephen Greer, he's very similar to many of these magicians uh, that are, quote unquote, stage magicians. And uh, when you take a look at um, some of the stage magicians, uh, there was one I think called Dynamo. I think at least was the stage name or something like that, similar to that. Uh, some of the stage magicians who have uh, performed um, incredible feats that are literally impossible. Uh, they're, they're definitely working with gin. And um, uh, I'm, I don't remember exactly the name of the one individual um, in question. Uh, again, I bleach a lot of these people from my mind, uh, but he was always just vaguely repellent to me. And he uh, performed amazing feats, some of them uh, pretty much mocking Christ, um, providing fish from a basket, uh, for instance, for people in Africa. Um, uh, some of his levitation was performed in front of the Jesus statue in uh, the um, Brazil. Uh, and uh, he, he was basically walking on water. Uh, uh, just a number of, uh, of, of uh, so-called magic tricks that are uh, essentially uh, miracles in mockery of Christ would be the best way to describe them. Uh, and uh, this particular magician, uh, who, who I just simply remember him as going by the name of Dynamo, something Dynamo, uh, he uh, was someone who apparently was sickly as a child and then uh, it bullied. Uh, he actually said this in one of his acts. He actually had a uh, animation, uh, animation produced of himself as a child being bullied and pushed into uh, a lake as a child. And uh, he had various physical illnesses that rendered him weak and uh, uh, unsportsworthy. And uh, he ultimately uh, took a trip to um, one of those crossroads and uh, made that deal late at night where uh, um, many people in the West would think of uh, the devil or demons. but. Uh, he's really uh, comporting with the jinn, uh, and he therefore is imbued with any number of uh, powers, uh, while the jinn maintain um, their affiliation with him. Now, um, oft times in such relationships, uh, the affiliation at some point breaks, and when it breaks, then the individual. Um, basically withers up and dies. Uh, your energy becomes very entwine, intertwined with these entities, uh, providing you uh, the very essence of your life. And uh, in the end, when they withdraw, they withdraw your life force with them uh, and you essentially wither up and die. This is uh, something that might have happened to this individual. I think his powers waned a few times uh, and uh, he was unable to pull off simple tricks on stage. Uh, so there might have been a taunt or a threat 
uh, by the Jinn affiliated with them to withdraw their um, uh, their deal uh, that they had uh, set up with him. Um, so when it comes to Stephen Greer, he's essentially someone um, similar to that. He uh, um, will say that it's aliens and, uh, and and people buy into that because they want to believe in a universe full of life. Um, what uh, what boggles my mind uh, about humanity, and it's a pathology that is inexplicable to me, uh, is a good example is if you were to... Um, Try and educate people about the immense amount of life on Earth. And you were to tell them about the uh, life in the rainforest, uh, various other undiscovered species in uh, the heart of the Congo. The fact that we have uh, cryptids, uh, relic populations. Uh, People are fascinated by this and they'll listen, uh, but most people in the end do nothing to act upon it, such as supporting or sponsoring preservation of the rainforest or uh, conservation of species. There's very few people who have the resources or the time to invest in acting on such uh, largesse. So uh, people really uh, take no action uh, for something like that. Uh, When you tell them that... uh, the rainforest is being cut and burned, torched, people feel bad. Uh, When you tell them that every acre that's plowed under, uh, thousands of species disappear with it, that uh, thousands of plants disappear, herbs, all of these are potential sources for toxins and medications that medical science could use to advance humanity, um, to improve the human condition exponentially to ultimately conceivably extend the human life. Uh, uh, All of this is real uh, and people who are made aware of it will acknowledge it, but will not act. But if you were to identify by the Mars rover, some fat fucking earthworm on Mars, then people would throw their tax dollars by the billions to send ultimately some astronauts up to Mars to recover some of these fat earthworms to prove that there's life on another world. These people are not interested in what's on Earth with its cornucopia, its uh, infinitude that it has to offer. They only want something out there they're insane they're self-destructive they're stupid there's no word no amount uh there's no negative descriptive that does justice uh so when it comes to stephen greer he's working with the jinn that are here the same kind the stage magicians are working with but he'll tell you that they're aliens and then everybody will give them all the money they've got just to get that feeling that they've got some in on that universe out there full of life because they can't stand the thought that they're alone. Do you think you, that, I mean, are, are, are we alone? Is there such a thing as, as aliens or, or not? Of course, I've uh, said this often before, and I'll reiterate my stance, which people get very angry about and even violent about. Uh, the United States government put a, all of these problems through the ringer, through the most massive supercomputers that they've got. And uh, they processed uh, the uh, equation that if every star in our universe had a habitable planet like Earth orbiting it, and uh, and that planet had uh, all the ingredients that we had here that led to our life. How long would it take for life to evolve in the universe? And all of the computers basically crunching all of these numbers, which are impossibly astronomically large, 
uh, basically concluded that life itself is impossible. Life is impossible. So by all accounts, logically, we should not be here. This is the ultimate proof for God. That there is a creator, which the government does not want you to know. So the government has never made this known. So that being said, everything that evolved evolved in this solar system either on earth or on mars or venus or the other planets when they were in the habitable green zone that goldilocks zone far enough away from the sun close enough to it far enough away so they don't burn up close enough to it so they don't uh freeze at one point venus was in this zone and another point mars was the ancient Victorian era perspective of our universe, our solar system in particular, was far more accurate. And that was that the uh, planets were in order of their state of evolution, that the uh, planet Mercury was a nascent Earth, the way Earth looked when it first formed, uh, overheated, uh, flowing with lava, uh boiling uh venus was much more like earth at a primitive level of uh a greenhouse effect uh later on the runaway greenhouse effect turned it into a hell earth is that temperate perfection zone mars is earth after it desiccates and dries and its magnetic core stops generating enough magnetism to retain our atmosphere and everything is literally blown away into space and it becomes an arid desert and the planetoids after mars the asteroids are more like the ultimate collapse degeneration and disintegration of the planet so this is all of this is in a perfect uh row of the developmental spectrum of a planet we're right in the middle and uh, where Mars once was, as the first place life developed, or re rather the planetoids, the uh, so-called asteroids, the vermin stars of uh, the asteroid belt, the, uh, that was originally where life developed, then Mars at another time, uh, Earth, albeit Venus was once uh, also one of these uh, areas where life developed and still exists, likely in its atmosphere. Uh, what you have um, on Earth is where the majority of ancient populations developed and reached a level of intelligence and technology before the mass extinctions. The mass extinctions that wiped out each of these successive populations happened like clockwork simply because of the nemesis uh, brown dwarf star, our binary star, all the majority of star systems in the universe are binary star systems. We have a binary star system and our brown dwarf companion way out there is uh, known as Nemesis by the government. Uh, they will not release this information to the public. Nemesis is the cause of the mass extinctions in the sense that another giant planet around the size of Jupiter or so that goes through the Oort cloud will regularly every several hundred million years bombard the inner solar system by knocking out these asteroids, bolides, comets from the Oort cloud down to the inner solar system and it wipes out life on Earth combined with volcanism from the inside. Works like a clockwork mechanism. There's no other solar system in the universe like ours. Everywhere we look in the galaxy, uh, every solar system is not like ours at all. It's ours is the only one that can even develop life. It's uh, it's set up so perfectly so that these incoming bolides, the majority of them are absorbed by Jupiter in particular, which takes in all of the bolides into itself and therefore Earth isn't pelted into uninhabitability on a daily basis, which it otherwise would be. So we used to think that the solar systems all evolved like ours out of some disk shape accretion system none of them are like that they've got giant Ju jovian type planets jupiter-like planets flash up against their suns boiling 
They're completely erratic in their orbits as opposed to flattened disk like like ours. So uh, ours is the only solar system with life. Multiple intelligences have evolved here. These are the relic populations that survived the mass extinctions from before and believe that someday they'll inherit the Earth again, which is why they cling on to their existence. They may very well do that if we wipe ourselves out with pollution and global warming. So when it comes to humanity, if you're stuck on a desert island, still oasis enough to support you, like the Blue Lagoon movie, uh, who wants the, that existence at all if you're alone? Maybe you would feel less alone if you had the company of schools and pods of dolphins. Their cetaceans, their mammals, you can interact with them. But if you didn't have the dolphins and all you had were termitaries and anthills, I doubt anyone would feel that an ant colony gave them company. You would rather be alone <laughs> than live with ants. The majority of human beings, because you could wake up with them all over you and biting you uh, and leaving you in agony. So when it comes to our universe, people for some reason think that we're alone and they don't want to be alone. So they have to populate this universe with this fantasy that it's seething with life. But all the life that's here is where it's seething. We are the seed from which the rest of the universe will be populated. What about all those little greys that I've actually seen them and I know I know others have, but I remember seeing some and pulling off those little, uh, their eyes, those eyes, they're just visors and pulling off their visors and behind them, um, I couldn't actually see what was behind them. But uh, they use, and actually Aquino, when he abducted me that time on the fourth abduction, because he did it for an entire week. So literally, as soon as I shut my eyes, I was pulled out of my body via my feet and he put me in a <clears throat> astral detention and started to taser me and um, ask me what I wanted from him. And interestingly, um, on the last day, <coughs> there were greys present. Mm -hmm. So are they used by the military then, those greys? Are they just like a psyop? No, they're quite real. Uh, this is a relic population, depending on what kind of grey you saw, uh, the size. Uh, if you're talking about something extremely small, then we're talking about a different kind of um, creature no, they entirely. Were, they were quite big. Yes, big. these are Cho. Uh, oh. So I've gone into this in depth, and um, as a matter of fact, um, my co-author Peter Moon is writing uh, as much as he can about this in his latest book, which is uh, not yet published. He's working on it uh, with great intensity. Uh, the Cho are a Southeast Asian pygmy tribe that are cannibalistic and uh, they are subhuman, uh, a subspecies of uh, creature that is not human. Uh, they are um, uh, not Asiatic. They uh, are simply a subspecies of human that uh, became uh, stranded in Asia. Uh, they uh, specialize, if you will, evolutionarily uh, in invading people's dreams and uh, basically sucking their essence dry. Uh, Asians, of course, were their food for thousands of years. The Laotians, the Hmong, the Montagnards, the various tribes of Southeast Asia that helped the Americans fight off communism and therefore had to escape Asia when it fell to the communists. They were fed on by the Cho for thousands of years. Originally, the Chinese were. The Japanese gained much Chinese collaboration by exterminating the Cho in China. The Cho are effectively exterminated in the Chinese mainland. 
they uh, survived in Southeast Asia, where the Americans then, after the fall of Saigon, imported 40,000 of them to the United States and Canada. And uh, they were originally feeding on the Southeast Asian immigrants who were brought over here as their food. The Laotians would ward them off in their own homeland by making animal sacrifices to their ancestors to protect them at night from the dream invasions. The, uh, in the United States, they had no capability of making animal sacrifices around a, a village pillar to protect their people. So the Cho fed on them unto death. They all experienced the overwhelming amount of the male population of these emigres experienced SUNDS, S-U-N-D-S, Sudden Unexpected Nocturnal Death Syndrome. Uh, they would wake up with the pressure on their chest, the knowing that there was an alien presence in the room. The, uh, they would die clawing at the air, their eyes bugged out. I would hear their screams at night. I grew up with this in the Tenderloin where they were all shipped to, dumped into the most dangerous area of San Francisco. In the compound, as the police called it, 270 Turk Street, El Cerrito Apartments, which still stands today in the Tenderloin, one of the taller buildings of the Tenderloin, 100 units, 10, 10 stories, each one, 10, each one of the 10 floors has 10 units. Uh, we would hear them dying, screaming in their sleep. And the next day, the manager would come, round up volunteers like my father, who would kick the door down and recover their bodies. Their bodies were completely paralyzed, stiff, clawing at the air. Just their mouths open as they died screaming in terror, their eyes bugged out. These were the victims of the Cho. What happened was Dr. Cheryl Adler, a female medical anthropologist, told the U.S. government, all of these Asian immigrants are going to die off. Half the male population is already dead. They're all going to die unless you allow me to help them relocate into the rural areas of America where they can have a village pillar to make act animal sacrifices to call upon their ancestors to protect them at night. When the Congress asked her, why don't you just have them call on Jesus? And she pointed out the fact that those that converted to Christianity and called on Jesus for help, those were the ones that died 100%. Uh, the conversion to Christianity earned them immediate death. None of the Christians survived. Anyone who converted to Christianity, well, there are no Christians in those communities because they all died. Uh, so Christ was of no help here. The Congress allowed her to relocate them. At that point, they had no food. So Aquino and the U.S. government unleashed them on the American people. And they had Whitley Strieber as their propagandist. Whitley Strieber wrote a book so that American people would volunteer to be fed on. He wrote a book called Communion and said, these are aliens. These aliens have come to help you. And that's why they abduct you. And yeah, you'll experience horror and pain. And you'll experience horrible experiments. But in the end, they're only here to tell you to eat less sugar. That was the conclusion of his first book, Communion. And so... He propagandized for them, and then Americans all began to see greys because the chill were unleashed on them. The chill fed at night, invaded their dreams, and the Americans were told, these are aliens from outer space. They're aliens from outer space. And you're just experiencing what many other Americans are experiencing, but the government won't, won't uh, admit to it. And uh, the government was the biggest proponent of this alien myth so that Americans would just feel that they were somehow blessed because it's aliens. See, this is the psychosis, the pathology I'm talking about. If the Americans were told that a bunch of Southeast Asian cannibal pygmies had been imported here and were feeding on them, they'd be outraged. But if you tell them it's aliens, then it's cool. Then it's like, um, yeah, I'm so special. This is how Westerners have their heads so far up their ass that they're high on their own fumes. They're beyond insane. I can't explain anything they do. Uh, they're truly not even a culture. They're simply a prison rape anti-culture <laughs> that somehow has 
just uh, you, this. It's not much longer for this world. It can't be. It's too insanely self-destructive. So when it comes to uh, Stephen Greer, he's working with the Jin, and uh, Whitley Strieber's working with the Cho, and they're propagandizing it all as aliens so that people buy into it and uh, and uh, and just fall for their bullshit, and then wind up think wind up being voluntary cattle, thinking that their experiences are somehow privilege. It's a oh. uh, what about these Palladians that Billy Meyer, um, Billy Meyer spoke to? The, Pal the Palladians? Well, and what about Bill star seeds? I mean, Palladians and star seeds. Are some people star seeds and are there such thing as Palladians? When it comes to the experiences of Billy Meyer, of course, Billy Meyer had genuine experiences. Billy Meyer caught the attention of uh, authorities, so to speak. Certainly the US government took him seriously. Uh, this is because he was contacted by the Thousand Year Reich in exile, the uh, Third Reich in exile. Uh, understand that the Third Reich gained an enormous leap in technology when it came to, among other things, the uh, Subramanian Chandra Sekhar. Subramanian Chandra Sekhar was a Asian Indian physicist who proved mathematically the collapsing point of stars where they uh, collapsed in among themselves and became gravitic black holes. Uh, the, at the time in Britain, Sir Arthur Eddington, who was Britain's primary astronomer, wanted to push his big toe, T-O-E, his big toe, his theory of everything, T-O-E, theory of everything. But uh, the acronym, I think, says it all. Uh, he didn't get anywhere with his big toe, but he managed to sabotage Subramanian Chandra Sekhar from being taken seriously and said, this guy's just a yellow nigger. Don't listen to him. You got me. And But the Germans considered Subramanian Chandra Sekhar, who was a member of the Aryan caste of India, uh, to be uh promulgating arian science they took him seriously and by you know, understanding the black hole as die schwarzen Sohn, the black sun they realized that at the center of every galaxy which is naturally hockenkreuz or hooked cross shaped every galaxy is shaped like a swastika this swastika is kept together by the gravitic pole of a supermassive schwarzen Sohn, a black sun at its center that amasses all of the core of the galaxy towards which the arms spiral or spiral about. We are in a galactic arm, Earth. The core, of course, is too much in terms of bright stars super clustering around that supermassive Schwarzenzon, black sun, black hole for us to tolerate as life forms. So the Nazis taking this science and working with it got a half a hundred year leap in technology and science simply by applying the physics behind Deich and Sohn, the black sun, developing technologies like Deich Glocke, the bell, uh, ultimately uh, uh, unraveling some of the secrets of space and time itself. When it comes to uh, the leap in technology, think about uh, the magnetic tape that they developed Siemens technology firm, IG Fabin, working with uh, the first computers, supercomputers, really. When you think of things that people invented, say, for instance, uh, the one thing you'll notice is certain inventions, every nation will claim they invented it. Uh, when it comes to flight, the Americans will tell you about the Wright brothers. Uh, I forget who the Russians claim, but the Russians will claim they attained heavier than air flight first with some Russian bozo taken off in some ornithopter or some shit. Uh, the reality is the first heavier than air flight was conducted by a Brazilian. Uh, but historically, but none of these people have that in their history books in Russia or America. When it comes to television, the British who claim they invented television. 
if you come to the United States, the Mormons will claim they invented television. Some Mormon guy put together uh, some cathode rays and shit, and they say they invented television. Uh, the reality is that the failed Reich was the first to use television statewide as a communications mechanism. That's why in the movie Contact, you see at the edge of that shell of radio and television waves, which travel at the speed of light, first comes Marconi's S, which was to celebrate Showa, his ascension to the throne of the Japanese emperor, Marconi being an Italian fascist, celebrating that fact. There's an S at the edge of that shell of ever-expanding radio and light waves. And then it's followed by my biological father, Adolf Hitler, in the movie Contact. This is why the Germans claimed they contacted aliens and told the West, uh, lay off and allow us to evacuate our population to Unterland, the underland, the land below, beneath Antarctica and beneath the crust of the surface of the earth, or the aliens will intervene because they received our message from our Fuhrer and recognized the Third Reich as the only legitimate government of Earth. They only recognized one government of Earth and we were the first to contact them. They recognize us. They backed that up with their radio controlled magnesium, multi-headed magnesium flares known as Kraut balls, what the Americans called Foo Fighters that would buzz American and British planes. The British had instituted the Massey Project during World War II to study these UFOs and they convinced the Americans that aliens had indeed sponsored the Third Reich and would respond with violent force if they didn't allow the Nazis to evacuate. So the Nazis attained a enormous victory uh, to relocate to uh, their government and millions of Aryan, Nordic Aryan peoples, including many Slavs such as Ukrainians who collaborated with them down into Unterland, where their breakaway civilization prospered after forcing trade with the surface world through, uh, well, forcing blackouts on New York, showing that they could shut down America's energy, uh, derailing rocket launches as they're seen on film doing. Uh, the thousand year Reich in exile then developed their technology to the point where they would trade that with the Americans for supplies for many generations. So when I talk about these inventions, can anyone tell me who invented the integrated circuit? Over 99% of all the highest quality integrated circuits in the world are produced where I was born, Taiwan. But Taiwan didn't invent them. But do the Russians, the British, or the Americans claim they did? No one knows the name of who invented the integrated circuit. That's because it was traded technology from the Third Reich. But the Americans will tell you, it's from gray aliens at Roswell. It's the gray aliens gave it to us. Because they don't want you to know that the Third Reich still exists. Even though they indoctrinate you through first person shooter games to kill Nazis on sight. Because we're still legally at war with the thousand year Reich in exile. These were the Pleiadians that contacted Billy Meyer. And uh, then Billy Meyer got addicted to the attention and started hanging up little Christmas baubles and shit that he was making and uh, discredited himself. Uh, the Thousand Year Reich in Exile is responsible for many UFO sightings, and they'll tell people that they're from Alderbaran or the Pleiades. They'll tell people that uh, uh, they're aliens because why would they tell you otherwise? There's no reason for them to do anything other than fuck with your brain. It's not like they have a good history with the surface world, the allied civilizations, quote unquote. They're not civilized at all. They're the barbarians tried to exterminate the Nordic Aryan peoples. So the Nordic Aryans are what Europeans generally see, whereas Americans generally see greys, the Cho. The reason Europeans will generally see Nordic Aryans is because the Reich in exile will raid Europe for genetic materials. They've taken some from you. They've taken some from Marina Saren in Spain. Uh, they take them from uh, people who fit the genotype or have past lives affiliated with the Reich. Why do they do that? 
to maintain their population base uh, and also to uh, maintain a evolutionary responsive uh, system to surface world developments. The allied world on the surface of this planet could conceivably wipe out the breakaway civilization beneath the surface of the Earth with disease, just like they did the Aztecas and the conquistadors invading the Inca peoples. The conquistadors were crawling with disease. The Aztecs were a clean people. They bathed. When the conquistadors showed up, the Aztec people had to burn incense, which the conquistadors thought was an offering. Uh, the reality was the Aztecs couldn't stand their body odor. Uh, the Europeans were filthy. They never bathed. And they uh, inflicted the Aztecs with disease that wiped the population out. As with the Inca, this was how so few conquistadors conquered entire civilizations. Biological warfare by living in filth. But how could they? How the can Allied they, surface oh, world is like that. The how Allied can surface they? World. How, how, yes, it is. I mean, with COVID as well. I mean, how can they live? Is it at the center of the Earth? How can they live there? Isn't it hot? No, the um, this is the mistake that many people make. Even the old. Department of Defense or CIA records would sometimes use that term, the hollow earth. It's strictly vernacular or nomenclature. That's not the situation. The earth is has layers of uh, various sphere of material. That is very hot. We're talking about within the crust of the earth. But the crust of the Earth, while it's like paper thin compared to all these other layers that we speculate lead to a molten core with which essentially produces the magnetism, the magnetic field that retains our atmosphere without which we cannot live. One of the reasons Mars is arid and lifeless is because its magnetic field died effectively. Uh, our magnetic field from the core of the Earth is what makes our planet livable, habitable. But the crust, which seems paper thin on a diagram or a globe, if you take a look at the oceans, which we know are incredibly deep, the oceans, if you looked at them on scale on a globe, would be like a puddle of water that covered like just a millimeter of the surface of that globe all the way around. It would like be only a little few millimeters deeper at the Marianas Trench on a globe that was proportionate. The reality is to a human being, these depths are immense. So the crust of the Earth is that way to a human body. The Third Reich is entirely located within that crust of the Earth what is properly referenced as the inner earth, not the hollow earth, the inner earth within that crust, but it's miles below us. To us, the depths are immense. There are at least 17 major caverns the size of the Grand Canyon within the crust of the earth all around the globe. The Chinese can reach the these depths if they tried an invasion of Winterland through Tibet. The most convenient entry point with a massive entrance capacity for mass migration was through Antarctica, which is why the Nazis con conquered Antarctica simply for that exodus, after which Antarctica was vacated by the Nazis on the surface. They, uh, during that time, the last great battles of the Atlantic were held over Antarctica. And they went nuclear. The Americans called it Project Argus. This was to prevent the Nazi connection to the base they had established on the moon. 
this created an artificial Van Allen radiation belt, which rendered space lethal to all astronauts or cosmonauts, or in the German phrase, Raummänner, spacemen. And uh, the Americans were trying to starve the lunar base, Lunastat, on the south pole of the moon established by the Nazis of any resupply uh, by preventing anyone from going through this artificial Van Allen radiation belt, which lasted for months before it disintegrated, sank to Earth and gave everybody cancer. Our cancer rates went way up worldwide. This was caused by three atomic bombs. They blew over Antarctica. So when it came to the uh, other points, uh, Nikola Tesla had his own entry point to the inner Earth in Long Island that was later sealed under orders of J. Edgar Hoover in the 1940s when uh, the U.S. government was stealing everything they could from Tesla's documents. Uh, the Americans access Unterland or the land below through a trade point in uh, northern Greenland. They refer to it colloquially as Ice Station Zebra. But it's an old NORAD radar station. That has an entry point into the inner Earth, not the hollow Earth. Just understand that water is corrosive and there's more water under the Earth than there is in all the world's oceans. And this water has corroded enormous caverns that are connected by underground river systems. This is what renders it habitable. The Nazis occupied these 17 major caverns all across the. Rock sphere. The uh, that crust of the Earth. And they've occupied hundreds more that are more like minor. Occupation centers. Using nuclear boring. Nuclear tunnel boring. They've interconnected all of this through communications. And uh, using technology they mine from the moon and other planets, uh, they've developed technology like the integrated circuit, which our world depends on on the surface. But they can't produce enough of that for trade. The Taiwanese do. The Taiwanese, I was born in Taiwan. Taiwan is declared the Axis nation by the United Nations, the last Axis nation on the surface of the Earth. And for that reason, the United Nations is at war with my Taiwan and will not recognize them as a nation state. Yeah, it's in their charter, Title 42 of the United Nations Charter. In lieu of a constitution, they have a charter. They've declared war on Hitlerism, just as the Allied Alliance under Anglo leadership during World War Zero, the Napoleonic Wars, declared war against Napoleon as a person rather than against the French people. The Allies through the United Nations declared war against the person of Hitler and the ideology of Hitlerism as opposed to various population bases, even though they specify Italy, Germany and Japan. The last bastion of Hitlerism on the surface of the earth, according to the United Nations, is my Taiwan. But that's where the overwhelming majority of microchips are produced, without which your civilization cannot survive. And Taiwan, being the most technologically advanced nation on earth, cannot be invaded. So uh, this is real life Wakanda. Due to its connections with the Third Reich. This is why if the Third Reich is ever to try to reestablish contact with the surface world. Using the old radio code, they won't be contacting Berlin. They would be contacting the city in which I was born, the capital of Taiwan, Taipei. This is the situation with the geopolitics of your world, which. No one is allowed to know. So when it comes to uh, the breakaway civilization of the thousand year Reich in exile, one source of UFO experience, the Chochoa, of course, uh, 
uh, subspecies of cannibal pygmies out of Southeast Asia is another source of the so-called alien experience. When I show the reality of the world with your average Westerner, they simply shut down. They want a universe of aliens so they don't feel alone. When their own world is alien enough. Uh, but um, back to you, honey, if you can think of anything else to speak of. Uh, I don't yeah. know how much time you have left. Yeah. Um, oh, well, I have to I have to go at two. Um, no, that was really interesting and enlightening. I, I made a lot of notes. Um, thank you very much. There's so much information there. Um, I want to think about all that. There's quite a lot. Thank you. So interesting. Bless you. Thank you. And I appreciate these opportunities to communicate, of course. Uh, thank you so much for all that you've done. And of course, don't forget to provide me the links and and tell me what to put into. Aside from the link, I understand that to be a given, but anything else you want put into the summary of uh, this um, interview when I publish it, uh, then just let me know. Uh, write me uh, as to what I should title it, etc. cetera, and I'll, uh, I'll put that in there. OK. Oh, brilliant. I'll do that. Thank you very much, Douglas. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, let's plan for next month again around the yeah. same time. And uh, yes, so uh, we'll we'll schedule for that soon. And uh, until next time we speak. Uh, all right. And you lots of love. Thank you, Douglas. Thank Bye. you. Lots of love to you as well. Bye for now. Take care. Have a great week. Great month. And you. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye for now.